Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here this morning. Let's just bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the description of your character that it gives us. And I pray as we um, delve into your word this morning, may you open our hearts to receive your word. And I pray that you'll speak through me and use me today for Christ's sake. Amen. So this sermon today is going to be based on our first Sabbath reading of uh, the week of prayer. But I'm not going to read directly from it. Uh, I'm going to just base my sermon on that. Now, as you will notice, you, I have uh, termed the uh, sermon fishing or fishing. Now, I could have used the, uh, the week of prayer uh, reading heading, which said, I will go make disciples. Um, but I'm sure that this title has made you a little more curious. First of all, let's have a look at a couple of passages in Scripture. First of all, we'll turn to Matthew 4.18, and you may choose to look it up on your Bible, or I have it up here um, for those who don't have. And it says here in Matthew 4.18 to 22, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two brethren, two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And also we'll look at Luke 5.27. And it says, And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi, that is Matthew, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left, rose up and followed him. The question is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And if we don't know what it means to follow Jesus, maybe we are not following Jesus in the truest sense. And if we're not following Jesus in the truest sense, are we taking the Lord's name in vain? And you might think that's a bit of a tough statement really. Well, if we go to Exodus 20, verse 7, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. What does it mean to take the Lord's name in vain? Now, I must admit, when I was younger, the only understanding I had was that of that was swearing uses, using God's name, or blasphemy, as we call it. Now, We know that uh, since the Queen has died, there's going to be some change of titles. And we might disagree or agree on who should have those titles, but I'm not going to get into politics today, so I thought I'd take a different slant. Now, what does it mean when we say that Sam or Toysha is a true foster? What do we think of the fosters? Okay, let let me imagine that one of the things we would think of is that they stand for spirituality, caring, generous, respectful, leading by example. Would you say that's a true representation of the fosters that we know? Okay. So can you imagine one of those young people behaving aggressively or rudely or unruly? If so, would we say, there goes a foster? We wouldn't, would we? You'd say, but they call themselves a foster, but they are taking that name in vain because their behaviour does not uphold that name. In fact, one dictionary states vain as without success or result. I recently took an elder's devotion on the opportunities Jesus gave Judas, and this reminded, uh, got me reading, uh, sorry, and this reading got me thinking about what characterises a follower or disciple. And I would strongly recommend you read the book of Desire of Ages. Was Judas a disciple, a real disciple, 
or just part of the team? Was he taking the name of Jesus in vain? Jesus said to Peter and Andrew, I will make you fishers of men. How many of you have heard of fishing, PH, fishing? One definition is email lures sent, setting out hooks to fish for passwords and financial data from the sea of internet users. Or another definition we have up here, I think, is the fraudulent practice of sending emails purporting to be from reputable companies in order to induce individuals to reveal personal information such as passwords and credit card numbers. So how could somebody who seemed to want to follow Jesus be fraudulent? Could it be motive? Let's have a little look at uh, the desire of ages. I think I've got that one. Oops. Try that again. Where am I, Warren? Just crashed. That's fine. Crashing is good. Okay, let's continue on. While Jesus was preparing the disciples for their ordination, this is in Desire of Ages, page 293. While Jesus was preparing the disciples for their ordination, one who had not been summoned urged his presence upon, among them. It was Judas Iscariot, a man who professed to be a follower of Christ. He now came forward soliciting a place in this inner circle of disciples. With great earnestness and apparent sincerity, he declared, Master, I will follow thee what whithersoever thou goest. Jesus was neither repulsed nor welcomed him, but uttered only the mournful words, The foxes have holes, and the birds of air had nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Matthew 8, 19 and 20. Judas believed Jesus to be the Messiah, and by joining the apostles, he hoped to secure a high position in the new kingdom. I'll just read that bit again. Judas believed Jesus to be the Messiah, and by joining to the apostles, he hoped to secure a high position in the new kingdom. This hope Jesus designed to cut off by the statement about his poverty. And in Desire of Ages 559, it says, Judas was treasure for the disciples, and from their little store he had secretly drawn his own use, thus narrowing down their resources to a meagre pittance. He was eager to put into the bag all that he could obtain. The treasure in the bag was often drawn upon to relieve the poor. And when something that Judas did not think essential was bought, he would say, why is this waste? Why was not the cost of this put into the bag that I carry for the poor? Which bag he was taking out for his own personal use. So... It said Judas believed to be the Messiah. Is it enough to believe? Will believing change you? Will believing save you? And of course in James 2.19 it says, You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So Peter and John were brought before the Jewish leaders after healing a lame man and preaching about Jesus at the, Jesus at the temple. And it says, and when they had set them in the midst, he, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, and then he proceeded to make quite a lengthy and very bold statement, a very different Peter from before. And in Acts 4.13, he says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant... That was obvious, evidently. Unlearned and ignorant, they marvelled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Judas had been with Jesus, but he was never accused of such. So aside from what Jesus taught, when John the Baptist was asked for evidence that he was a Messiah, in Luke 7.22 it says, Then Jesus answered unto them, so the disciples went from John the Baptist to ask Jesus about who he was. And Jesus said to them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have heard and seen, 
how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And another situation in John 14, 8, it says, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it suffices us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? You've seen me. What's that meaning? You've seen my character in action. You've seen the Father's character in action. So, how important do you need to be, or how well do you need to preach to be a disciple? How will others know that you have been with Jesus? So we have an interesting story in the story of Dorcas. Now, just for your information, it talks about um, Lydda, the town of Lydda, uh, which is now Lod, and it's a city 15 kilometres southeast of Tel Aviv in central Israel. It says in Acts 9.36, Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. (coughs) And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as little was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, he brought him into, they brought him into the upper chamber and all the windows, widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put, all for, put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turned him to the body. He said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. So what was it about Dorcas' life that God chose to raise her in particular? (coughs) Well, if we go to uh, Spirit of Prophecy, um, Volume 3, it says, Joppa was near Lydda, and at the time Tabitha, called Dorcas by interpretation, lay there dead. She had been a worthy disciple of Jesus Christ and her life had been characterised by deeds of charity and kindness to the poor and sorrowful and by zeal in the cause of truth. Her death was a great loss. The infant church could not well spare her efforts. When the believers heard of the marvellous cures which Peter had performed in Lydda, they greatly desired to come to Joppa. Messages were sent to him to solicit his presence there. So, are you more like a Dorcas and her quiet acts of service or, Paul, or like Paul, boldly sharing principles of truth? If you think that only Paul's service was important and he certainly had a miraculous healing at Lystra after he was stoned, which one was raised from the dead to continue their work? Our reading, our week of prayer reading, is, raised, is um, to, headed, I will go make disciples. So how do we make disciples? Well, for a start, we need to be one ourselves, to not take the name of Jesus in vain, so to speak. Have you ever tried to, support, to show support for or to sell something that you're not convinced of yourself? It's hard, isn't it? If I was going to be a salesman, I'd sell petrol. Everybody wants it. What about if you saw some amazing results of a product that you were going to sell and you saw it with your very eyes? That would be different. So how did the 11 become disciples, true followers of Jesus, is what they spent time with him. So how then do we then disciple others? That is, tell, we can tell them what we've learned by spending time with him and the change that has brought about in our lives. 
It's interesting when somebody says to you, you should try this medication for your whatever it is. My brother's uncle's daughter's sister's niece tried it and it worked great. You're not interested in that. What about if I tried it and it worked for me? That's a different story. So share that and they will also want to spend time with him. If we look in um, the reading on page 5 here, it talks about disciple making is a process. <clears throat> it says, making disciples is a process. It is more than presenting a series of evangelistic meetings, as vital as they are. It is more than feeding the homeless, cleaning up a neighbourhood, doing a health fair or giving Bible studies, as important as these activities may be. The first step in discipleship process is becoming disciples ourselves. We must study the pattern and become like Jesus, who is meek and lowly of heart, pure and undefiled. The way we do that is by spending time with him each day, studying his word, contemplating its meaning, communing with him through prayer and by his power, surrendering all to him and obeying his commands. The grace of Christ is a transforming power, changing us from being hearers to doers of the word of God. So unless we're surrendering all to him and obeying his commands, we're a bit like Judas, believing in and hanging around Jesus but not allowing, not allowing a change in our lives. What about Peter? There were many failures in his life, but he had a desire to be with Jesus and this allowed growth and finally surrender. In Psalms 34, 8 it says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Unfortunately, sometimes we feel we need to give people the whole Bible in one go gluten steaks, roast spud and Brussels sprouts. All of these are good for you, but if a person has been unwell in sin, you might want to start with a little veggie broth, a taste. It reminds me when my father was dying of pancreatic cancer. He, it was, it was, he had given up long before his time and he wasn't eating and he wouldn't give anything I gave him. So what I decided to do I became a bit sneaky. Um, I remembered the things that he liked to eat when I was young. And so I would go and prepare a meal and I'd sit next to him while he watched TV with my meal and he'd look at it and he'd go, you haven't got a little bit more of that, have you? And I'd say, I think I have. And so I'd go out into the kitchen and I'd get a large plate and put a small amount in the middle and present it to him and of course it looked very manageable. Rather than trying to tell him he needed to get his strength and here's a great big plate of food. In our reading it continues on. The next step as revealed in the life of the early disciples is to share with others what we ourselves have experienced. What we have seen and heard through our walk with Jesus inviting them to taste and see that the Lord is good. And once they give their lives to him in baptism, these new ones in the faith are still in need of discipling through mentorship by more experienced disciples in the faith. If I was to show you that rhythm, a heart rhythm, now regardless of whether you know anything medical, it looks pretty good. Okay, if you watch TV, that looks good. You don't have to know whether the P to R interval or the QRS or the T wave is suitable or it's got a correct Q to T interval or anything like that. It looks good and I'd be happy with that if it was mine. That's called sinus rhythm. If I go to this one, you'd say, hmm, um, bit slow and there's something wrong happening there. Otherwise it looks okay but I'm a little bit worried at that rate if I was go to this one, suddenly all the nurses in the audience are going, ooh, is that a second degree Mobitz 1 or a second degree Mobitz 2 or is it a complete heart block? And finally they will rest on complete heart block and they would be very, very worried because if we leave that alone, it might go to this and everybody now says that doesn't look bad, I don't want that one. 
So what we have to do is we have to do something about that before it eventuates to this. Now, well, you all know from watching TV that sometimes we have to restart somebody's heart. We don't use paddles much these days. We use pads that are different here and here. And we can shock somebody back into a normal rhythm. But of course, in this situation, we don't want to shock them back into a normal rhythm. We want to give them a rhythm. That's called pacing. So we can set the machine so it gives a little shock on a regular basis and keep them alive until we can do something more permanent, like a permanent pacemaker, or fix the problem that has caused it, whether it be hypoxia or electrolyte imbalance or medication that's toxic to them. But unfortunately, in most situations, these pads can only give the shock. So what we need is we need ECG leads. Now, I don't know where they got that photo of me, but anyway. <laughs> I try to hide it. Um, they need the ECG leads on there that senses what is happening. So what you need is the two. We need the pacing leads on the right and we need the sensing leads on the left. And that's a bit like our communication with God. We need the pads and a two-way communication. Then life is sustainable. That's like prayer and Bible study. We need to talk to him. We need to listen to him. And in that situation, we go from dead in sin to alive in Christ. I remember a, a song by Keith Green many years ago, which said, um, and it, hopefully this not does, not does, does not describe our church, but it said in the song, the church is a, sli is a, the world is asleep in the dark that the church can't help because it's asleep in the light. Now that would be a very, very sad thing to happen, wouldn't it? Unless we are true disciples. So when our relationship for eternity is being blocked by sin, he can sustain life if we let him into our lives and then we will live. But as I said, it's a two-way communication that allows this life-changing experience. In the board meeting held in January 2021, it was moved by our church that our theme should be that we need to be more committed to being the hands and feet of Jesus. And in February 2022, this year, it was moved that our theme be increased to time to act. And we were certainly given an opportunity to act as one of the many facets of being his hands and feet with the FUDs this year. However, are we his disciple in the fullest sense of the world? word? What work has God got for us to do as a denomination, as a congregation, and personally, are we ready? Are we even asking God to challenge us? When we look at history in the light of Daniel, we know what, where we stand. When we look at the world we live in, we recognise the signs and we know that Jesus is coming very soon. There is an urgency and it's not just about us being saved. Jesus died for everybody. And he wants everybody to say, have the same opportunity. Now, as it's the beginning of the week of prayer, I'm going to ask us now that we have a short season of prayer, asking God to lead us as a church and as individuals to be his hands and feet and recognising that now is the time to act and to show us where he would like us to be working, whether it be a Dorcas or a Paul. So what I'd like us to do at the moment is just divide into groups of two and three for prayer and then remain quiet until all groups are finished and then we'll come together again for benediction and the closing song. So if you'd just like to divide into groups of two and three at the moment and we'll come back together shortly. Thank you.